This is episode 139 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today we answer a listener's question about food anxiety. Are you ready? Stay tuned. My name is Stephanie Dodier, clinical nutritionist. I reversed my diagnosis of anxiety, depression, adrenal fatigue, and obesity by going beyond the food. I can tell you one thing, that willpower, discipline, and deprivation aren't the permanent solution to transforming your relationship to food. So how do you leave overeating, emotional eating, food craving, and binging behind you so you have the food freedom to achieve all of your goal and be happy now? As a top 25 alternative health podcast in the world, this is the Beyond the Food Show. I have created an audio training entitled How to Change Any Eating Habit, specifically the one that is sabotaging you. Three strategies to create the consistency and confidence you need to change your eating habit without willpower or discipline. I did this in order to help women like yourself engage with food in a completely different perspective so that they stop craving, overeating, binging, and using food to feel better. You can put an end to the cycle of frustration, the all or nothing mindset and shame towards your own body and become a motivated, consistent, focused and self-loving version of yourself. This free audio training is about the why we eat, how we eat, so that the what we eat can be easy, effortless, and pleasurable. So if you are ready to step into the new version of yourself so that you can change how you interact with food, head over to stephaniedodzie.com slash training right now. Ladies, I am back. I took a week off. Well, actually, more than a week, almost 10 days off of podcasting because I was creating the new audio training for all of you. So today is the day that we launch this new training. So you heard the little commercial on this new audio training. So go and download it. It's an hour and five minutes of absolutely the biggest nuggets of strategy and teaching that I took from all my program and I packaged it all together for you. So go and download it. And that's why I took a break from the podcast. Now we're back and we're going to answer a question from Casey and it goes as follow. So Casey sent me a DM on Instagram to answer a topic question that I wanted to know what you want. So she says, just want to share how much I love your message. I stumbled upon your podcast recently and it's quickly becoming my number one. Yay. One question that I have is I'd love for you to address our food anxiety. I have developed a lot of food fears when I went strict keto, air quote, and I'm working to undo these fears, but it's hard when science tells you otherwise. I'd love someday to be able to just eat a damn piece of cake on my birthday, just for an example, without feeling like I'm harming myself by doing so. Thank you. So Casey, this is a very popular question, particularly when I work with people 101. And here's the thing, I was there with you, Casey, And I know a lot of people listening right now are like raising their hand and saying, yep, that's me too. And for me, it was really overwhelming because let's face it, I'm a nutritionist. I read the science every day. I did the nutrition degree. I knew exactly by which biochemistry pathway the bad food was harming me. I become a real food police. I was shaming me, I was shaming other, I was trying to teach the entire world how to eat clean and keto, paleo, organic, and judge everyone around me. But you know why I stop? I stopped because I started to resent my life. So, 
part of ridding myself and teaching people how to rid themselves of food anxiety goes well beyond just addressing the science piece of it. As I always teach, our behavior around food is a relationship issue way beyond the food. So it's really not just about anxiety. It's about something much more bigger. And as you know, my answers are very comprehensive and they're vastly different than what you hear out there. So let's dive in. I want to preface this in saying this is not just for keto people. Okay, the answer I'm about to give is for the vegan people who have been told by maybe a health practitioner that they need to reintegrate animal product and they are in real fear to do so, or the paleo people who are freaking themselves out about having any form of dairy but secretly crave the cheese and when they do have it in secret... They shame themselves. This is for all of you. The answer is the same for all of us. So we're going to break this down in kind of a four-part series. So we're going to talk about number one, what is anxiety? And particularly, what is food anxiety? So when we look at the definition of anxiety first, the definition is a feeling of worry, nervousness, and unease, typically coming from a trigger, right? Right. And it can become a disorder in which when it becomes a disorder, it prevents you from doing activity and enjoying life. Here's a fundamental principle about anxiety that the world of mindfulness has brought forward and has later been demonstrated with neuroscience, right? Anxiety is us being worried about the future and depression is being worried about the past and constantly reminding ourselves of what happened in the past. Happiness is being in the now. So when we're talking about anxiety, it's the worry. And as Casey said, she's worried about the effect of the cake that will have on her health. Now, what happened when we are frequently or consistently into the future, right? And we're worrying. That act of worrying, that act of not being in the moment and being afraid actually engage our fight or flight system in our body. So for those that are not familiar, we have a part of our brain called the brainstem. That's our survival center. And the only function of that part of our brain is to scan the environment and understand if there's danger for us right? That it is real danger or not, the brain stem and the survival part of your brain doesn't care. It just scans around, scans your thoughts, scans your belief and say, oh my God, the piece of cake is danger. Because your brain and you have put the science into your brain that white flour, high fructose corn syrup were deadly. And it's true. And we'll get to that in just a bit. Science does say that high fructose corn syrup is extremely dangerous. So you've put that information into your brain. Your brain captured this information, sees the piece of cake, engage the fight or flight mechanism into your brain, and then you have an entire body reaction. So we teach that emotion is an entire nervous system body situation or an emotion, a feeling into your body. And then that presents itself in you feeling anxious. Whatever it is for you, what it means to feel anxious, that it is tension in your shoulder, constant monkey thoughts. We each have different presentation of that feeling and that emotion in our body. And then you stress, you obsess about the high fructose corn syrup or the white flour into the cake. And you end up having like, tummy pain and you're not digesting properly and there's a whole slew of action that happens if you did have to have the piece of cake, right? It all comes from the actual bodily system called the fight or flight, the survival part of your brain that sees and perceives and believes that the piece of cake is dangerous, right? So how does it come to the point where your brain sees this innocent piece of cake to be dangerous. It's fear, right? You have categorized 
you have labeled, you have judged that white flour or high fructose corn syrup or meat for vegan to be bad. And you have learned that perspective. You have, over the time, created this association that this food was dangerous for you. The problem is that your mind, your subconscious mind, your nervous system does not make the difference between a big elephant chasing you in the wild and the birthday cake sitting on the table. All it knows is that there's danger around that and your body, your entire body reacts in the same way that it is the elephant running after you or the piece of cake. It engaged the same process. Now, now that we understand that, that's where food anxiety comes from, right? The question that we do have to answer is, is it really true? Is it really true that the white flour, the high fructose corn syrup, the form of sugar used in the cake is going to kill me? So when we look at science, science is clear, High fructose corn syrup can be toxic and it can lead to early diabetes. And yes, it was tested, but here how it was tested. (laughs) It was tested on animals that were only fed high fructose corn syrup over days and a long period of time. Is that representative of A, the human body, Two, is it representative of you having that one piece of cake one day a year? No. So yes, it is toxic when consumed over a long period of time in a chronic setting like many people in modern society, right? They do consume high fructose syrup day in and day out, right? Think about the pop drinker. Think about the people who eat processed food all the time, right? Yes, they do consume high fructose corn syrup. And yes, there's a massive risk for early diabetes for those people. But does that mean you? That's the question, right? And the same thing would go, and I want to go to the other people because we just don't have keto people here. We have vegan people, right? That Here's a crazy thing about the meat situation is there is studies showing that meat is unhealthy and dangerous for your health. Yet, on that same study site called PubMed, we have study showing that animal products are safe for human consumption and we shouldn't avoid it. Why? Because it's the methodology that is used behind the science to demonstrate an outcome. So is it dangerous to eat meat? Well, like anything else, right? If you, and I want to be careful here because there's carnivore diet now where people eat 90% meat all day long, right? Is that healthy? God only knows. I mean, the Inuit in the North ate probably 80 to 90% of their diet in meat and they survive. Here's the thing. This is where it's leading me. The human body is extremely adaptable, Meaning that we have this innate capacity to adapt. We can survive nearly, nearly everything. We have a resilience, physiological resilience inside of us. That's crazy. That's why people who eat high fructose corn syrup day in and day out are still alive. At 45 years old, after drinking six pops, can of Coke every day. I've seen them in my clinic. They're still alive and they still function. So does that one piece of cake with white flour and high fructose corn syrup is going to kill you? No. So then why? Why is it that your brain captured this information, the science piece that you read or you listened on the podcast and made it a threat for you. Why does that happen, right? The real issue here is not that one piece of cake for your birthday or the vegan who want to start eating one meal a day or a few meals a day of meat. 
The issue, the root cause issue is the perfectionism. It's your subconscious pattern, your perspective on life overall, and the desire to be perfect. That's what the real issue is. Now I want to pause here and I want to make a sidebar. I want to make the sidebar in which people that may be listening right now that are working with a healthcare provider, a healthcare practitioner, and to resolve their health issue have been placed on a therapeutic diet. So for the people to understand in the world of functional medicine, in the world of nutrition, we have a number of diet that we use as medicine. We call them therapeutic diet. Ketogenic diet was, and it still is, a therapeutic diet, meaning that it was created, invented to heal epilepsy back in the 1900, like early 1900. And it stayed as a therapeutic diet, meaning that people suffering certain condition were placed on the therapeutic ketogenic diet forever as a mean of managing their condition. So there is this world of therapeutic diet. So I'm not talking to you. If that's you and you're working with a healthcare practitioner and you've been placed on the therapeutic diet, we're not saying that you can go out and have example If you have an autoimmune condition and you're reacting to nightshade, don't go out and have nightshade because Stephanie said that food anxiety is just my perfectionism. That's not what we're saying here. But what we're saying is that the vast majority of people are using diets such as paleo, keto, vegan, not because they're being given by a healthcare practitioner. They're using those diets as a mean of achieving a personal goal, be it weight loss, health, whatever, right? That's irrelevant what it is. That's the people to whom we're talking to today, okay? So I wanted to make that pause because you want to be respectful of the treatment plan that has been given to you. But I always say to people that I work with from a nutritional perspective, like I use therapeutic diet. I do it less and less because I focus more on the Beyond the Food method and the academy, but I just recently placed someone on an elimination diet, and I was really clear from the beginning, this is not a lifelong way of living. This is for six to eight weeks, and then you're going to start reintegrating food. So I want to be clear on that. Now that that parenthesis, that sidebar is done, I want to move back to perfectionism as the root cause of the food anxiety. And I want to read you a quote. So for all of you who are going to go and download the new audio program, you're going to hear me quote that. But I wanted to bring it up to all of you because I think it is so, so relevant to us here in the Beyond the Food community. When perfectionism is driving us, shame is riding shotgun And fear is the annoying backseat driver. That's a quote from Brené Brown. Brené Brown is a New York Times bestseller author that I would highly recommend you go seek her book, The Gift of and Perfection. She continues to say that when we struggle with perfectionism, what we feel the most sensitive to shame is what we're perfectionists about. Perfectionist mindset goes as follows. When I look perfect, when I live perfect, when I work perfect, and in our case, when I eat perfect, I can avoid or minimize criticism, shame, and ridicule. Pay attention here. She continues to say, very clearly, based on her research, because Brene is a researcher, that all perfectionism is, is a 20-ton shield that we carry around that will keep us from being hurt, when in truth, what it does is keep us from being seen. Crazy, right? So how much 
of our perfectionism in the way we eat is in fact a self-esteem, a self-confidence, a self-worth issue. How much is your brain or how much are you using food science and nutrition science to justify your perfectionism? You have to be really honest with yourself here and be able to draw the line. Do an assessment, look at your life and ask yourself, how much of me not eating the birthday cake and blaming it on the science is just a justification for my perfectionism? Look beyond the food. Look in the rest of your life. Do you have perfectionism tendency? And is that a consequence of you being told somewhere in your life that you weren't good enough or you weren't perfect enough? So when I look at food anxiety, that's what I look at. I look at what is causing the anxiety? What's the underneath behavior that we're trying to justify with food anxiety? And 99% of the time, it is self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence issue tied and wrapped with a big bow with perfectionism. And then we go around with a badge of honor justifying our perfectionism, just like I did, right? I was the food police in my entire family and in my friends and even among nutritionists. Like I was the hardcore one who did everything 100% all the time until I started binging because I resented life so much and I suffered so much that I started to binge. So what's the solution? right? Where do we go from here? Number one, you go and download the audio training, stephaniedoze.com slash training, and you do the entire training. It's not just me talking, it's me requiring you to do some exercise. Second, you consider applying the 80-20 rule in your life. So what's the 80-20 rule? The 80-20 rule is that 80% of the time, You follow your dietary guideline of choice very closely, and 20% of the time, you are free to eat what your body wants. And that can be the piece of cake, right? Now, we're not talking to the therapeutic folks here. We're not talking to those of you who may have Hashimoto's and that there is a link between gluten and Hashimoto, and you're not, I don't want to say recovered, you're not in remission yet, and you can have a flare-up. We're not talking to you here. We're talking to all the other average people, like me, like you, like Casey probably. 80-20 rule. And that 80-20 rule is well beyond just food, right? Look at any other place in your life where you're looking for perfection. You probably need to apply the 80-20 rule rule. And here's the thing. Beyond justifying our perfectionism through food science, what we also do is we don't allow ourselves the 20% because we're going to shame ourselves. So we really got to put ourselves in check of not shaming ourselves for what we do. Here's the other fear. Well, Stephanie, 20% of the time, I'm just going to eat crap all the time. Well, you may in the beginning, But if you follow my guidance properly in the training and all the other stuff that I have out there, you will connect with your body and you will realize that when you eat the croissant or the birthday cake, you don't feel so good after. So you're going to take that into consideration when you live your 20% of your life, right? Are you wanting to feel like that? So then it's not going to become a... I don't eat the birthday cake because there is white flour and high fructose corn syrup in it. But rather, you know what? I don't feel like having the birthday cake because I know I'm going to get constipated after or I know I'm going to get bloated or whatever. Or maybe it's going to be, I'm going to have the birthday cake because nothing happens when I have one piece. The problem comes when I have it every day, right? It's about connecting with our body and understanding what works with our body and what doesn't and then cultivating the self compassion or the self-love to not hurt ourselves through our food choices, right? So I hope, Casey, that helped you. I hope it helped all of you who are suffering from food anxiety. 
the real bill call out here is look beyond just the anxiety and look at what's driving the behavior. I'm hopeful that it's going to help a lot of you. And if it's so, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review for the podcast right there from your listening device. Or if you are in the show note, you can click the link. I would really appreciate it because it fuels me. And it helps us rank the podcast higher so more women can discover this amazing message that is the Beyond the Food Method. Sunday, so in three days, two days, we have our miraculous episode coming out. And I'm not killing you. So in the last episode 138, I shared with you the things that I'm afraid to tell you. And one of them was my journey with pain and low back pain and how I work from my couch for almost a year. You didn't see that from the upfront, but I work from my couch for almost a year in extreme pain. And I was able to heal that. Although I have two herniated discs, bulging discs, stenosis, arthritis, I was able to reverse that. And the how I did that will be shared in the next episode with the author of the book that I use to do that. So if you are suffering from any form of pain, any type of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, I urge you to listen to episode 140 with the author of the book, The Great Deception Pain. It's going to tremendously impact your life. So I love you and I hope to see you in the next episode. And have a good day. My first diet was at 14 years old. I spent years trying to figure out what was the right diet for me, the right quantity of food to eat, when to eat it. What's worse is that I was seeing the same in my patients. I struggle with craving, overeating on healthy food, emotional eating and binging no matter what diet I was on. Keto, paleo, organic, whole food, nothing was stopping it. No one spoke about struggling and I felt so alone and broken. And you may be feeling the same. Maybe you're thinking the more restriction has to be the solution. If only I could be tougher with myself, I wouldn't crave and have those urges. And if it doesn't stop right now, where are you going to end up? You see, what most struggling women never, ever realize is that your relationship to food is simply a reflection to your relationship with yourself. Sadly, most people rely on outdated strategy like restriction, dieting, willpower, and discipline, and they think that is the solution. Things like black and white mindset, diet pills, or cheat days to control their urges. But you and I both know that being a normal eater is nothing but that. So that's why I want to peel back the curtain and show you exactly how I have changed my relationship to food and how I teach my student to stop overeating, binging, and emotional eating to move to food freedom. And quite frankly, it's different from anything you've ever heard before. I have created an audio training program entitled How to Change Any Eating Habit, specifically the one that is sabotaging you. And inside of that training, I'll show you the three strategies that I use and that I teach that create consistency and confidence that you need to change your eating habit without willpower and discipline. Plus, I'll coach you on specific exercise you need to do in order to implement these strategies successfully in your own life. In order to help women like yourself engage with food in a completely different perspective so that you can stop craving, overeating, binging, and using food to feel better. So if you are ready to step into a new version of yourself that can change permanently the relationship to food that you have right now, head over to stephaniedodzie.com slash training. And I'll see you on the other side.